In the depth of our souls, we find ourselves trapped in the bondage of sin. Shackles of fear, chains of shame, locks of guilt confine us. We strive to break free, yearning for a release from our prison. But the walls seem impenetrable, and hope begins to fade. But within the darkness, there is a light, a whisper, a promise of liberation through Jesus Christ. As we surrender to him, our burdens begin to lighten. What once held us captive are now broken under the weight of his grace and mercy. Because of Christ's love and sacrifice, we are released to walk in purpose and hope. Through him, we are finally free indeed. Hey, what's up, Resonate Church? It's awesome to see you this morning. Hey, I want to welcome all of our guests out here and out there. If you are joining one of our campuses in Hayward or online, um, hey, welcome. So glad that you're joining us today. You are well taken care of. You are noticed. You are loved. And we're glad that you're here. We are starting a brand new, uh, we are in a series, a summer series called Free Indeed. And um, it's a very significant series. And I know that sometimes churches um, off-ramp or maybe uh, downshift a little bit during summer, not anticipating uh, people coming to hear the Word of God. As you can see, both in Hayward and here, that's not the case. I believe that Spirit is moving in a unique way, and I believe that God wants to talk to you. And we've been talking about all the ways that we've been enslaved in the past of things that we didn't know, and God wants to free us. In a sense, our, our cell doors are open, and Romans 7 and 8 will tell us that we're no longer in bondage to Adam, but we've been liberated in freedom, set free from Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? And so this is what he does, and this is what he wants to free us from. And today we're going to talk about something that you might not even know that you're enslaved in, which is we want freedom from religion. You're like, wait, wait a minute. I thought Christianity is religion. I don't want freedom from Christianity. No. At the end of our time, my prayer, my hope is that the Holy Spirit will address you and move you from a religious person to a Christian. And with that said, I saw an illustration this week that I thought was helpful, and I modified it and decided to teach you this. Um, do you know what these are? Cucumbers. Cucumbers. Thank you. Um, the first service uh, got it wrong. <laughs> 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 so these are cucumbers. These are beautiful cucumbers. Um, I won't even ask what kind. Okay, those are cucumbers. You know what these are? Pickles. They're, they're glorious pickles. And what happens is once you're a cucumber, but if you are immersed in this brine made of vinegar, dill, peppercorn, and garlic, and other spices, and you are sealed, when you're immersed and sealed as a cucumber, you are transformed. And little do you know, but that, that transformation gives you a brand new identity. You're no longer a cucumber. You are a pickle. Okay? <laughs> Praise God. Now listen, um, this is what happens also in your life. When you are in the brine of God's grace and give you a moment, to actually marinate in it. You're immersed and sealed through the Holy Spirit of God's grace. You too will be transformed and you too will inherit a brand new identity and you move from once being a religious cucumber to a glorious grace-filled pickle. That's what happens. That's what happens. And it's incredible. And you would think that that's like something that everybody knows, but you know, there's some people in this room that don't know the reality of how glorious pickle are and how you could actually be transformed. I didn't know because when I first became a Christian, uh, I never heard the gospel. I never set foot in a church until the end of my college years. Okay, somebody shared the gospel with me. I understood what Jesus did, and so I surrendered my life, and I laid down everything for Jesus. And that meant that I created a very long list of all the things to do and all the things I shouldn't do. And so the very first thing I did as a Christian was I broke up with my non-Christian girlfriend to pursue a life of celibacy that planned celibacy for three years that ended up turning eight years. Eight years of non-dating, eight years of just trying to meet the Lord every day. I 
would do my devotions. I would read the Bible every single day. And then when I started going to church, some Christians told me that R-rated movies are a thing of the devil. And so I stopped watching R-rated movies and turned my attention to D- Disney movies until somebody told me those are a thing of the devil too. <laughs> so, and secular music also were the thing of the devil. So I stopped listening to secular music except G- Bee Gees because their harmony is heavenly, right? I mean, that's just, it's from God. And so, so and, then, and then somebody said, well, you know what? If you are a serious Christian, you share the gospel to your neighbors. So I went door to door evangelizing. Then went further and got on the plane uh, 22 hours to Russia, stayed there a month for my very first mission trip. Then I learned that Christians love the poor. So I started every single year, you know, sponsoring children from World Vision. And I went all the way and literally dropped my aspirations of becoming an orthopedic surgeon and went to seminary and became a pastor. Now, from the outside, you might say, well, Ryan, you did everything that a Christian does. And from the appearance from the outside, you're like, you're a very serious Christian. But could I just share with you something that was happening inside? What was happening from the inside is that there was no joy. There was a lot of mechanics. There was a lot of to-dos, but there weren't very opportunities to be. And in and, and some sense, I, I didn't have a relationship with God because I thought God was always upset at me. I thought God was always telling me to do better, do better, and do better. And my list that I was trying to accomplish, I wasn't doing it perfectly. And I'm Asian, so I have the disposition to get 100%. And so this was really hard for me. And so I really thought all along God was upset at me over and over and over again. And later, through the gospel, being immersed and sealed in the gospel, did I finally realize that there was transformation, that Christianity is not about following a set of rules. Because if it was, then we wouldn't be very different from all the other religions that are all about following rules like Buddhism and Islam. But Christianity is not about following just rules. I'll tell you what the goal of the gospel is, is not to follow a set of rules, but for you to be free to enjoy God's grace. That is the goal of the gospel, which gives you then the power to obey for the pleasure of his glory. And so let me share with you the difference up front between religion and Christianity. This is how I define it. Religion is the work for the approval of God, while Christianity is the work from the approval of God. Do you see the difference? You might say, well, that's only a preposition. No, there's a massive difference. One is for the approval. You want to please God, and, and, and you want to be approved by him. And Christianity says the other thing. He said, no, you work out of the already given approval of God. And that's massively different. This is so different. It is as different as a cucumber to a pickle. You know, I just came back from Disneyland last week, and never did I see a single person walk around with a giant cucumber in their hand. No, but you know what I did see? People with a giant pickle. Why? Because pickles are transformed, and they are glorious, and they are good. And yeah, we should all hold a pickle every Sunday. This is what we should do. It's glorious and wonderful. And pickles are glorious. Cucumbers are like watermelon without the pink stuff. That's all it is, right? It's just, it's not as awesome. It's not as awesome. And my hope is that you would know the difference between the two, that you be deeply convicted today of the reality that Christianity sets you, sets you free. And the way it does is that it gets you understand, to understand that you already have the approval that you are working for. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, would you please turn to Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, and we're going to read starting from verse 9 through 14, and we'll hear a parable that Jesus teaches. And in all of our campuses, if you would, please stand for the reading of God's word. And as always, I'll pray that the Holy Spirit preach a better sermon than the one that you're about to hear from me today. Luke 18, starting from verse 9, this is the word of the Lord. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, And treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, 
extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That is the word of the Lord for this great Sunday morning. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Please, you may have a seat. This passage shows us a problem that we all have. And because of this problem, we fall into this particular pattern. But the pattern is something that we could break out from and that we could reach our potential. So I want to talk about those three things. First, here is our problem if you're taking notes. We are all desperate for approval. We are all desperate for approval. You, me, everyone in this room, we're desperate for it. In some ways, we're wired for it. Look at how it shows itself in verse 9. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Okay, right off the bat, it shows a universal problem that you and I all have. It's found in the word righteous. Now, in our culture, we don't use that word that often, righteous. But in the biblical sense, what righteous meant is approval or acceptance. That's what it meant. And the reality is you and I all long to receive this acceptance. We all long for approval in one way or another, especially outside of our voice. We want a verdict that comes from the outside to us. And this is why you and I continue to watch those movies that have underdogs in them where the underdogs go up to become heroes. You know, the, the lowly high schooler that is a nobody becomes a prom queen or, or the guy, the loser athlete that becomes a hero in that one game. We love that. Why? Because when we watch it, if they could be approved, if they could be accepted, then maybe perhaps we could be accepted too. That's why we love it. It's the same reason why you and I, some of us still have like these old love notes from not even your spouse, but you keep it for some reason, or some encouragement note, they might not even mean the things that they wrote. But you'll read it over and over again. Why? Because you're so desperately in need of approval. For men, some of you have old trophies that are literally, it was handed to you 30 years ago. 30 years ago. Like, I don't even understand why you would do that. 30 years ago, you're like, you're like, the reality is you could jump like two inches right now. You know what I mean? And like, I don't know why you're holding this trophy. How does it encourage you? Why? Because in it, In ourselves, there's this desperate need to want to be approved, to be accepted, and to be loved, and to be respected. And this is why you and I hate criticism, by the way. You and I are deathly scared of criticism. Why? Because it takes away that approval. It takes away that acceptance. And this is how we operate because this is really the nature of our hearts. And here in this parable, this Pharisee is deeply invested in his moral righteousness, not to please God, it's very clear, but because he wanted approval. The theological word here is righteousness. The psychological word here is self-esteem. See, he desperately wanted self-esteem. And he says to himself, oh, thank you that I'm not like other men because I tithe, I fast, and I'm not an adulterer. You see, he is like giving kudos to himself. He's so so thirsty for affirmation that he gives it to himself. When's the last time you went up to the mirror and said, man, I'm an awesome dude. I mean, does that help you? You know, I once saw a a person wear this t-shirt that said, you are enough. And I remember thinking, thank you. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and there were like these characters all about me. You know, you're smart, you're strong, you're brave, you're kind. And then I walked away thinking, okay, who said that to me? Who said that to me? Did the person say that to me? Did the t-shirt say that to me? Who is the voice behind that great affirmation, you are enough? I don't care. I wanted it. I wanted that affirmation. Oh, my gosh, I am enough. I'm smart, I'm brave, I'm this and that. And we're so thirsty for affirmation, we're so thirsty for approval that we will get it from a t-shirt from no voice at all. That's how thirsty we are. So 
kids, we live for popularity. That's everything. As young adults, we live for experiences because that's approval too. Look at all the things that I get to do that you don't get to. It's a subtle flex. You know, as parents, we want good kids. Man, that's not so subtle flex when you put the bumper sticker on it, my kids are honor a blah, blah, blah. Everybody gets that. <laughs> Midlife crisis hits. You want to buy an expensive car. Why? Because you dream of that moment when you're at a red light and somebody stares at you and they're like thinking, man, that must be an important person. Or conversely, you don't want to buy a minivan because somebody might pull up and say, what a loser. <laughs> you don't want that, right? This is why, you know, um, Botox and liposuction, that's what it's all about. Do you know that Americans spend $18 billion with a B on plastic surgery every single year because we're desperate for somebody from the outside to tell us you are approved. You are amazing. You are beautiful. You look great. You are smart. You are awesome. Could I tell you, young people, it is our, all of our older people's greatest goal to go to the check stand and they're like, ID please for your alcohol. I'm like, you mean me? <laughs> My goodness, you think I look 21? Thank you. Like, it is our aspiration, okay, for somebody to say that when we're like literally in 30-somethings. That's because we're approved. We look great. You're awesome. Man, you and I have a deep longing for approval. That's our problem. Then what is our pattern? What's our pattern? What's our solution? I'll tell you what our solution is. Then we go to religion, which actually takes an outside-in approach. Religion takes an outside-in approach. Outside means you work the things from the outside that people can see, hopefully to change you from the inside. It doesn't work. I'll tell you here. Verse 10, two men walked up into the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now, can I sh share with you, this is an outside-in approach. How? Do you remember that uh, comedian Jeff Foxworthy? Okay, if you do, then you just dated yourself. He's an old guy, right? And, but he, he had this bit that made him really famous. He says, you know, you're a redneck if. Right? Well, today we're going to play a similar game. You are a religious person if. Ready? So if you're taking notes first, you might be religious if you are superficial. Superficial. Now notice here this Pharisee's understanding of sin is completely external. It's completely focused on behavior. All about just keeping rules. And he says, I don't steal. I don't cheat. I don't fast. I mean, I, I, I fast. I tithe. But notice... It's nothing about the inner self. It's nothing about character that is inside. You know, notice he doesn't say, Lord, thank you that I'm becoming more patient. He's not saying, thank you that I'm being more loving to people that I have a hard time uh, being lovely to. He's not saying that. It's all external behaviors. In other words, his view of sin and righteousness is only about the things that can be seen. Not his heart, not his character, and the reason why religious people love external work, number one, is because it can be seen. Unlike the inner work, oftentimes you can't see it. And secondly, because it can be seen on the outside, you get credit for it. See, this is the important part. We work on the outside, why? Because we want credit for it. And man, you and I, we're, we have a predicament. We have a problem because this is our pattern. For the record, I do this all the time. I'll do it all the time. You know what I don't do all the time? The dishes. I don't do it all the time. But when I do, could I tell you, I only do it when the dishes are piled up. Do you know why? Because I fear the day when there's few dishes and I wash it and I don't get credit for it. You know, nobody notices it. My wife doesn't say thank you. So you know what? The days when it's like a behemoth of a mountain, you know, and I know my wife is flat out tired. She's like, I'm not going to do it. I said, da-da-da-da, I will do it. 
I will be the servant of this household, and I will wash and clink and clang and do everything. Oh, my goodness. Wow, this is so dirty. This stain is really hard to get out. I will make all these comments, and I will clean everything, wipe the counter, everything, dry off everything, so that my wife will notice and say, honey, you are the savior of our family. Thank you so much. And I do it for recognition. And there are versions of that that you do as well. It's all superficiality. Secondly, you might be religious if you are arrogant. And boy, do Christians really suffer from this. Verse 11, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now, I want you to notice here that this guy is looking down at everybody. He says, I don't steal because the Bible says to not steal. He says, you know, I don't cheat because the Bible says not to. You know, he goes, I, I tithe because the Bible tells me to. And look at what he does. He, he goes up a notch, right? He says, I fast twice a week. Now, I want you to notice this because the Bible doesn't say that, that you fast twice a week. In fact, he was a Pharisee. That means he obeyed the Mosaic law. That was his Bible. In the Mosaic law, you fast once a year, always on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. That's when you fast once a year. But this guy doesn't say, I fast twice a year. He says, I fast twice a week. Which is to say, not that I do things differently than you. I'm better than you. I'm just better than you. I'm more righteous than you. And this is a typical outside-in approach to finding our righteousness because we start outside and say, if I live a good life, God owes me. See, we don't want to depend on God. We don't want his grace. I want to earn that. And so I'm going to earn it by living righteously so one day I could twist God's arm and say, God, I've lived righteously. Now you owe me. Now you see the relationship there? That's a relationship between a savior and a savior. So you're trying to save yourself. See, this is what righteous, external, arrogant people do. Because, you know, and, and I know this, that many of us believe, and conversely, we think, well, you know, because I'm not living a good life, I, I know that God's going to curse me, or he's not going to bless me. And, and, and listen, God certainly does not approve of your sin. In fact, he hates it. But if you are a Christian today, could I just be utterly, flat out, clear with you, you today are not approved by the obedience to God. You are only approved by the obedience of Jesus' life. He completed the race. He lived the perfect life and gave you that credit upon yourself. And that is the only sign and the reality of your approval today. The only reason why you stand approved by God is not your life but Jesus' life. It's true. It's only by Jesus that you stand today before God. And this is the problem, you know, because we work in this outside in approach. The world has seen us, that we're better than you. We look down upon you. That's why philosophers like Karl Marx and Michael Foucault, you know, the French philosopher, they would say this, religious people use morality to gain power in society to gain a self. And that is an indictment to the Christians, but it also happens to be true. Have you seen social media? Have you seen the way we re interact? Is it compassion? Is it humility? No, it is like thumbing our nose down and saying, you are awful people because you do this, you do that. This is what happens. And the worst way that I see Christians exercise this arrogance is when, when we are so quickly to condemn people and other people's sin without hating our own sin. See, now, I don't mind if you have convictions for sins and the awful things that are happening in this world and for you to point it out, for you to talk about it, for you to dialogue. No, that's all good. That's all gravy. My only problem is that you tend to point fingers at other people's sin as if God has anointed you to be a prophet to do so without ever pointing that sin to yourself. That somehow you hate other people's brand of sin, but you love yours. And you love talking about every person's ills and woes, and yet you never deem to think that you yourself fall in the same kind of sin. 
So you accuse other, but accept yours. And this is why C.S. Lewis said this. He said, a moderately bad man knows that he's not very good. But a thoroughly bad man thinks he's aight. That's what he said exactly in, in English. You know, uh, aight. Like he says, so, you know, so Hitler, you know, ask Hitler if he was a bad man. He would say, no, I'm not so bad. Ask, you know, Abraham Lincoln, are you a bad man? He says, yeah, very. That's the reality. People who recognize their sin are humble. People who don't recognize their sin blame people. A Christian, listen, I, I want you to know this. A Christian doesn't just confess that they're sinners. They actually hate their sin. That's the difference. Yeah, you can confess that you're a sinner, but do you hate your sin? But a religious person don't hate their sin as much as they hate other people's sin. And is that you? If that is, then you're arrogant. And guess what? Your religion is showing. It's peaking. Here's the third thing. You might be religious if you're self-centered. If you're self-centered, if it's all about you, if you adore yourself, not adore God. Verse 11, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I get. Now, here's something so fascinating about this passage, this guy. You know, if you think, you know, you, you're starting off a prayer like, I thank you, God, that, you would immediately think that he's going to talk about God. <laughs> or he's going to talk about the things that God has done. But it's interesting. He says, I thank you, God, that, and all of a sudden, that's the last time he talks about God. But he starts beginning to talk about only himself. And he's like, I thank you, God, that you made me awesome. I am awesome. I'm so great. I don't cheat on my wife. I give money to the poor. I'm fascinating. And what ends up happening is that when this guy is doing this, it is not that he is centered on God, but he's essentially centered upon himself. The righteousness that he wants to achieve is not for the glory of God, but for the glory of himself. Now, look at how the Bible would address this. You notice when Jesus often pits a good guy and a bad guy together, it's always the bad guy that gets redeemed and justified. Do you realize that? It happens a lot. Like, for instance, Luke 15. Remember the famed story, the prodigal son? Here's a younger son who is like bad guy. He takes dad's inheritance and spends it on prostitute and comes back completely shamed. Here's the good guy, the good son, stays home, obeys his dad, but who gets justified and redeemed? It's the bad guy. Or, you know, in Luke 7, there's a Simon. He's, he's, a, he's a figure in his community. He's the good guy. And yet there's a bad gal. You know, she was the prostitute that poured oil on Jesus' feet. Who gets redeemed? It's the bad gal. Or here in this situation we see in Luke 18, you have this dude, the Pharisee, the good guy. He's like, I give 10% away. That means he's generous to the poor. He says, I don't commit adultery because, you know, I love my wife and I'm a faithful husband. You know, he's a good man. And on the other hand, there's a tax collector. He's a bad dude. You realize, do you realize who those guys were, tax collectors? They were kind of like the Jewish collaborators, you know, during the Nazis in the World War II era, right? These, these guys were gangsters. They were the shakedown artists. These guys were like robbing from their own people. It was awful. Their own people hated them, right? So here's a good man and here's a bad man. And here's the question, why does Jesus justify the bad guy and not the good guy? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there's two ways that you could reject God's grace. There are two ways that you could get out of God's brine of grace in your life. How? Number one is to reject all of God's law. And the other way is to obey all of them. But obey them in a way that gives yourself credit as to say that, look, God, I did everything. It is trying to save yourself. It is by being your own savior. It is to say, I don't need your grace. I don't want to be like the desperate guy like this tax collector. No, I'm an astute. I'm a figure in this society. I have it all put together, and you are making much of yourself, not making much of God. And so you're saying, God, I, I'm a lovable person. Look at how awesome I am. It must not be so hard to love me. 
is what he's saying. And the problem here is the reason why often the person who's a bad guy is being redeemed is because they know they're bad. And the danger of us being religious is that we don't know how bad we are also. That's why this is dangerous. That's why, because we're constantly part of this self-salvation project and we think we're in a better position than we are because we're less sinful than the tax collector and that's dangerous. That means you and I are not aware of our situation, our circumstance, because the utter reality is not only are you a sinner, you and I are in desperate need. I mean, a, absolutely abject, desperate need today of Jesus' grace. And you and I need to be brined in his grace and be swirled and stay there forever to enjoy God and his kindness so that we could glorify him and enjoy him forever. Amen? Amen. That is what we need to do. That's why the Bible over and over shows us the bad person and the good person and always redeems the bad person because they're aware. Sometimes the Good people don't know how much they need God. So, so that, that's a problem. That was our pattern. Then what is our potential? Where, where could we go? What is our hope? Here's the hope. The gospel invites us then to take an inside-out approach. Inside-out approach. Meaning something has to happen inside, and that will become the catalyst for you to live gloriously outside. Verse 13 but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now, church, would you look at this tax collector, how he finds his approval? He says, God, be merciful to me. The word mercy it's fascinating. You know, I was studying this passage this week, and I was looking at some scholarly commentary and that some amazing insight. And I thought it would help you to understand the significance of this mercy. Do you know that this word mercy that this tax collector uses is a very non-conventional word for mercy? In fact, the New Testament only writes about it twice. There's more of a common word for mercy. That is the Greek word elios which means compassion. In fact, when you read on in, John, in Luke chapter 19, you'll see a blind man crying out to Jesus as he walks by. Jesus, have mercy, Elias, or compassion on me. That's what he would shout. But in this case, the tax collector didn't use that word. He uses another word. The word is hilasterion, which means I need an atonement. I need a payment. It's a very unusual word, but this guy is not saying, please have compassion on me. He's saying, I need a payment for my wrong. I need a payment for my sin. You know where this word comes out pretty frequently? In the Old Testament, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translated version from the Hebrew and Aramaic of the Old Testament, it, it describes um, this word hilasterion comes out quite often, especially when you go to the temple and remember the Holy of Holies? There rested at the Ark of the Covenant, and God's Shekinah glory dwelt there, and no one could go into the Holy of Holies, right? It was fatal because what, what was buried in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, the tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai, right? And so if you enter into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, you'd be scrutinized by the Ten Commandments, and everyone will fall short. But once a year, remember Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in and sprinkle a sacrificial blood of an animal on top of the Ark of the Covenant, the gold slab called the mercy seat. Guess what that mercy seat was called? Hilasterion. That's what it was called, where the law was satisfied through a payment. Now, let me bring you back to the New Testament here. Okay, The only other time that the New Testament uses this specific word that the tax collector used was, is found in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. It says this, Therefore, Jesus Christ became merciful. There's that word, the root word, helasterion, and faithful high priest. He's the high priest that entered into the Holy of Holies in the service of God to make propitiation, which is atonement, which is the root word there is helasterion, 
for the sins of the people. And this is the word that the tax collector uses. He's not saying, God, I need you to overlook my sins. Here's the reason why. This tax collector knew that he was wretched and he's gonna continue to sin. And so he didn't need just to, somebody to overlook his sins. He needed a solution for his sins. And the solution was somebody must make an atoning payment for all of his sins. So what happened? How do we get this righteousness then? How, how did this tax collector get his righteousness? How was he justified? I'll tell you how. You see, when Jesus finally comes into the scene, he goes in his public ministry as it starts, he goes to see John the Baptist. And John the Baptist realizes it's Jesus. He's like, oh my goodness, it's Jesus. He's like, John, you need to baptize me. And John said, no, 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 no. I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus says, listen, John, you need to baptize me. And he gives this reason. He says, for I must fulfill all righteousness. That's what he says. He says, John, you don't understand. I need you to baptize me because I have to live a fulfilled righteous life because that righteous life will one day be credited onto your account and your sinful life will be credited onto my account that on the cross one day God will treat you as if you had lived Jesus's life and that he will treat Jesus as if he had lived our life and because of that that one day this life a full righteous life will be offered to you so that it will be as if you have lived that life and you'll be approved then forever and ever and ever even though you and I are still wretched sinners. You and I are not done messing up. We've done messed up and we're gonna be done messed up. We're gonna continue to mess up in our life. And yet now, because of the life of Jesus, not your life, but because his life was approved by God and now given to your credit, now you and I have the utmost final outside verdict approval that will never change, that will never separate from us. And God will love us no matter what we do. By faith, by his grace, we have been approved, not by our life, amen? This is good news of the gospel. And if you don't know this, this means that you have the kind of approval as if you have lived a perfect life. And so your final approval will not come from a t-shirt. Or you are enough. Listen, if God's approval of you right now through Christ's eternal and fulfilled righteous life is not enough for you, ain't no other approval in this world gonna be. None whatsoever. Either you accept God's approval by faith, by his grace, or you'll always be chasing something that you'll never get. It is only by God's grace you have this approval. And do you know what this means? You don't have to wait until the end of your life to wonder, man, did I, did I live a good enough life? The answer is no, but yes, you did because of Christ did it for you. The gospel says Jesus lived that life for you, and if you put your faith in him, that verdict over your life will never change. And this will lead you to want to obey God, you see? Because not to get an esteem for yourself, but you have all the esteem that you ever need from his approval. And so out of that, you no longer obey him because you have to, but you obey him because it's joyful to. It's free to, you get to do it out of your own freedom, out of your own delight in the one that has given you that life. So it's not a burden anymore. It's an incredible privilege. It's a joy. And you will be motivated to obey, not to get anything from God, because what you already have is everything from God. You have everything. And this is the inside out stuff. Do you see that? It's inside out Christianity is not obeying God for approval, but it's obeying God from his approval. And Jerry Bridges summarizes this thought incredibly well in this book, Transforming Grace. This is what he says. To sum up my sermon, he says, my observation of modern Christianity is that most of us tend to base our relationship with God on our performance instead on his grace. If we perform well, whatever well is in our opinion, then we expect God to bless us. 
If we haven't done so well, then our expectations are reduced accordingly. In this sense, we live by works rather than grace. We are saved by grace. We acknowledge that, but we are living by the sweat of our own performance. We give lip service to the grace of God, but our unspoken motto is, God helps those who help themselves. The realization that my daily relationship with God is based on the infinite merit of Christ instead of my own performance is a very freeing and joyful experience. What a great summary. I want to close my message by helping you to understand this joy. This joy that comes and bubbles up from the approval that you already have. You know, there's a passage in Deuteronomy 7. God says this, and I want us to look at it together. He says, Lord did not set his affection on you and chose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. No, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But guess what? It was because of the Lord loved you and redeemed you from the land of slavery. Do you see this? I want you to see this. God says, I chose you. God says, I, I put my affection on you. The question is why? Because you're not an adulterer? Because you tithe? Because you're not an extortioner? What, why, why did he do He says, I didn't choose you. I didn't put my affection on you because you're the greatest among the peoples. But in fact, you were the least. Then what does Deuteronomy 7 verse 8 say? I showered you. I bestowed. I put my affection on you. I loved you. Why? Here's the answer. Because it says, because I love you. Wait, that's rather circular, isn't it? God's saying, I love you because I love you. And that is the kind of everlasting, steadfast love that we need. And that will free us from our religion. Because there's a question my daughter loves to ask. And her question is, Daddy, why do you love me? Listen, when a woman asks that, it's a trap. <laughs> you better come up with a good answer. But imagine if I told my little daughter whose identity is being shaped right now by the affection of her dad. What if I said this to her? Baby, listen, I love you because you're a good dancer. I love you because you win trophies. I love you because you're skinny. I love you because you're pretty. I love you because you don't make mistakes like other people. I love you because you've never failed your daddy. I love you because you never complain. I love you because you're in shape. I love you because you're really good at school. I love you because you always get straight A's. That's such an Asian dad answer, right? <laughs> right? Right? B's make honey, A's make money. That's how it goes. <laughs> right? Now, could you imagine the kind of pressure my daughter feels? And imagine the day that she has a secret for me, but she can't tell because her daddy's gonna get crushed and he won't love me like he used to. So she keeps it to herself and she's always fearful of losing her daddy's love. Could you imagine that? That is the person with a religious experience with the God who's always wanting to give approval based on your obedience. But what if I said this to my daughter? Daddy, why do you love me? I said, baby girl, I love you because I'm made to love you. And you're made to be loved by me. And I can't change that. No matter what you do, no matter how far you go off, no matter what kind of mistakes you've ever made, it doesn't matter if you make grave mistakes today or even tomorrow. It doesn't matter if you leave me. It doesn't matter if you get impregnated by somebody. It doesn't matter if you go to jail. It does not matter what you do because I'm always gonna love you because 
I am made to love you, and you are made to be loved by me, and nothing could separate that love from me and from you. And Jesus loves you a billion times more. A billion. He can't separate his love from you. You were made to be loved by him. You were already approved. You and I are so undeserving. We have lived a wretched week, some of us. Some of us have made mistakes. Some of us have volitionally said to God, screw you. No matter what, God says, you think that could separate my love from you? Impossible. I love you because I love you. And that will never change, no matter how much you offend me, no matter how much you sin against me, that will never change. Now you're fully approved. Now live out of that love. You see, Christians, when you understand that brine of grace, as long as you are in it, you'll one day go from a cucumber to a glorious pickle. And that's my hope for you, that some of you went from being a religious person to say, I realize that I'm fully approved. Now I get to fully obey God because I enjoy God. That's my hope for you, church. Let's pray together. What a glorious truth that is not based on our life that we find approval and love, but it is based on somebody else's life that was fulfilled for us, and that is you, Christ. Christ, you did something that we could never do to obey the law. We're wretched sinners. Help us to feel our sin, only to know that you've taken them away. You absorbed it upon yourself and paid the debt so that we might live free. Gracious Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. I thank you, God, that you sent your son. I thank you, God, because you're more compassionate than we ever could ever give you credit for. I thank you, God, because you're more gracious and holy and lovely than we ever express unto you. Give us just this moment. Teach us through the Holy Spirit. Help us to be changed. Help us to know that our approval of you doesn't come from you, but because it came from Jesus, now we have it in full and nothing will ever change that. Help us to live out of that security so that you'll be pleased that our love for you will not be out of obligation, but it will be out of our joy and pleasure to glorify a God that is that good to us. We love you. In Christ, we worship you. It's a joy to And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's give him glory. Amen.